Good day to you. I am Carl Falk. Welcome to the Falk and Around podcast. Hope you're having a good week. It is Thanksgiving week, my favorite holiday of all. So much to be thankful for in 2020, you know, giving us time to not see our family, giving us time to not work, and all the other wonderful things that 2020 has given us. But remember, on Thursday, it's Thanksgiving Day. You only need three things on Thanksgiving. You need your family, and hopefully it's less than 10 people so Andrew Cuomo doesn't show up and arrest you. You need food, which obviously we're all going to eat a ton of turkey and then fall asleep. And you need football, the three Fs. It's all that matters about Thanksgiving. It is a great, great day. I know there is chaos around us, and everything seems to be getting worse with the COVID. Just take a moment on Thursday to be thankful for whatever you can find a reason to be thankful for. We all have a reason, even in a dark, dark year like 2020. So happy Thanksgiving to you all. Hope you have a great one. The Bills were off last week, and the bye week is always interesting to me, and I always find it interesting what coaches do during the bye week. And one of the big things I'm a fan of coaches doing is self-scouting. Coaches spend a ton of time looking at tape, predominantly of matchups for the other team. They also evaluate, obviously, their own tape. But you don't get the time to do a deep dive and self-scout on a week-to-week basis. There's just too many other things to do. So for the bye week, to be able to go back and do that and find an area of deficiency where you can improve your team. And the Bills certainly have areas of deficiency, and they both, in my opinion, involve the run game. They don't run the ball particularly well. I think they could, but they've morphed into a pass-first team very much under Brian Dable and with the emergence of Josh Allen and the receiving core that they have built up. It makes sense in the modern NFL. Of course, there's many schools of thought uh, when it comes to the running game. A lot of people think you can't run the football anymore in the NFL and win games, and I, I don't agree with that. I think you always have to run the ball to win games in the NFL. There comes a time where you've got to be able to run it. And when you do that, you shorten the clock, you give your defense a rest, all the little things, the ancillary benefits, if you will, of a running game. The Bills in spots have had good games running the football, but I don't believe they have a good running game at this point. And Before I get into Zach Moss and Devin Singletary, I want to talk about what's going on up front because I think that's really important for the overall approach of the Bills' offense these last six games. And what's going on up front is a little strange to me. Earlier this year, the Bills had re-signed Quit in Spain, gave him a contract, comes into camp. Things don't necessarily go as planned, loses his starting job, and gets cut. And there wasn't a whole lot said about why the decision was made to cut him. It was more or less just one of those things that the bills were going one way, Quentin Spain going another, wash our hands, move on. I thought it strange because frankly, I don't like the group of guards that the bills employ. I think Brian winners is very average. I think Ike Boker is, below average at best. Cody Ford isn't good yet. Maybe he will become good. He's only in his second year, obviously a high draft pick. So there's still hope there. If John Feliciano was healthy at the time of the quit in Spain release, I would have felt a little bit better because I think John Feliciano not only is good as a guard, he's also somebody who brings an attitude. And I talked about this last week on the pod that He brings an attitude to the team, and and that's something very important. Well, the latest victim of shuffling on the offensive line seems to be Mitch Morse. And last week when the Bills played, Mitch Morse was a healthy scratch. He he didn't – he dressed. He just didn't play. Feliciano got to start at center, Boker at one guard, and winners at the other. It didn't make sense to me. And a a, a strange situation. Last year, the Bills brought Mitch Morse in. They made him the highest paid center in the league. 
he was a huge addition to a rebuilding offensive line. With now Feliciano back healthy, I still think John Feliciano is the best guard on the Bills roster. I think Mitch Morse is the best center on the Bills roster. It would make a ton of sense to me to have both of those guys on the field at the same time, especially when you're trying to protect your young quarterback and trying to get the running game going, as we were talking about. But Sean McDermott has different ideas. Here's where I don't necessarily like how McDermott handles things. He hasn't said that Mitch Morris was benched. He just said that other guys were starting. And pressed on Monday about the upcoming game this week against the Los Angeles Chargers, he didn't answer the question truthfully. I shouldn't say truthfully, directly. Again, listen to Sean McDermott talk about the Mitch Moore situation in the offensive line as a whole. Uh, we'll see. Uh, he's in the mix. Uh, you know, we feel good about a number of the guys up front. We're getting healthier now, finally. Uh, it's been a while since we've had uh, a consistent lineup. So uh, we've got some guys and, and some options available to us, uh, Mitch being one of them. Yeah, nothing. I just think, other, uh, you know, we had some momentum coming off of the, the, the two games, the two wins we had there back-to-back uh, when Mitch was out. And that doesn't, um, you know, say anything in particular about Mitch. Just more so we, we had some momentum going and, and some continuity for a small window of time. And so um, we just felt like that that was the right lineup for that week. And like I said, he's he's uh, in the mix uh, this week, as are some others, and we'll see how the week flows. I find that extremely evasive of Sean McDermott. And, you know, for years we've heard about in the NFL, the offensive line, you want continuity. You want to develop a continuity. You want the same five guys as much as possible up front. They know each other. They read each other. They work as one. All of those things are opposite of what Sean McDermott's saying. You know, there's a lot of guys in the mix. We'll see what happens this week. Well, to me, that means that Mitch Morse is once again going to be on the sidelines. John Feliciano is going to be starting at center. Now, if you want to take a glass half full approach to this situation, the Bills are building depth. If you want to take a glass half empty, the Bills' highest paid offensive lineman and a guy that they signed earlier this year and is now gone are contributing nothing to the offensive line. And if you want to even go further than that, Cody Ford, has, who was a second-round pick last year, hasn't been somebody who's been a key contributor as well. And I know part of that is injury, but the other part of it is his inability to be better than the guys that they've signed off the street. So it's a strange situation up front. And I think if the Bills are going to make noise in the playoffs this year, they've got to be better up front. And they've got to be more consistent, especially in the running game. I think Josh Allen has gotten to a point where he, he's going to be what he is. And given time, he'll beat the opponent. I also think when pressured, the greater opportunity for Josh to try to play hero ball a little bit and make a mistake is going to come about. So the offensive line is going to be the key component, in my opinion, going forward and they're going to do so without Mitch Morrison I, again I just can't say enough how I disagree with Sean McDermott and this decision I, I love John Feliciano I love what he brings to the table as I've said but I want him at guard and I want him next to Mitch Morris I don't think it's an either or situation the way Sean McDermott is approaching this I think it's a we have to put them both out there you put your best players out there the bills are not doing that if mitch morris is on the sideline so it's a strange situation the one that bears watching and again this week with the self-scouting that the bills are doing if mitch morris doesn't play sunday he doesn't play again this year unless there's an injury up front and they move feliciano back to guard and that's really bizarre and it's something to watch going forward in the offseason when he'll be entering year three of what is still the highest paid center contract 
in the NFL. Another situation that bears watching is the Tommy Sweeney situation. Sweeney last year, seventh round pick out of BC, looks like a kid who can play in the league. He's been hurt this year, got hurt in camp, hasn't played. He's on the COVID restrictive list and won't play again this year due to the myocarditis situation with his heart. This was a concern when football came back, when sports in general came back post-COVID. You know, we, we tend to think of COVID when you're talking about professional athletes as something they get over quite quickly, and 99.9% of the time they do. But there are a few situations where there's long-lasting effects, and these are the effects we know of now. Tommy Sweeney is dealing with this issue now and will miss the year, and it's quite unfortunate because as you look at the Bills, again, self-scouting at the bye, Dawson Knox has not been improved in year two injuries have been part of the story but his catch percentage on targets is 50 percent josh allen only completes 50 percent of his passes to dawson knox it's not good enough tyler croft has been solid he's also been somebody who's been injured a little bit the bills going into the offseason need an improvement in their tight end position because they really don't get much from that but when you look at the wide receiver group it makes up quite a bit for the, what they lack there. But Tommy Sweeney's a situation definitely to keep an eye on going forward. So now we get to the point of how do you run the ball better? Devin Singletary and Zach Moss so far have combined for 625 yards through the first 10 games of the season. That's not good. That's 62 and a half yards per game. A combination of your two backs. That needs to improve the second half of the year or post by, I should say, greatly. It's got to be close to 90 yards per game the rest of the way. Personally, I think that this coaching staff sees something in Zach Moss that they don't see in Devin Singletary. And I'm not sure it's there. I like Zach Moss, his his, his abilities. I think he's got an opportunity to be a good back. Devin Singletary, I think, has an opportunity to be a very good back. I really think the time has come for the Bills to develop a 1 and a 1A. And, you know, a lot of teams, you see it with the Raiders, with Josh Jacobs to limit his carries. You even see it with the Titans, Derrick Henry. Every third series, the backup running back goes in and gets the workload. I think the Bills need to do that, too, because the other thing with the running game is the rhythm of the back and the offensive line to be in sync to maximize production doesn't happen overnight. And it takes time to develop. I don't think the Bills have worked hard enough to develop the running game with either Singletary or Moss. I think they've got to choose one as their main guy, develop that and work the other guy in, keep them both in the mix But definitely a two-thirds, one-third carry mix, I think, is the best way going forward. So let's see if they can do something better there. Defensively, it's stopping the run. They have been terrible stopping the run this year. And uh, you could point to Star Latula's opt-out as the biggest reason there. They don't have the one big tackle defensively who could take up blockers keep the linebackers' feet free, allow Ed Oliver to have single blocking assignment against him and and maybe beat his guy. It's a combination of things. Now, can the Bills fix that without that type of player? I think that's, again, where looking at self-scouting, Leslie Frazier and Sean McDermott will come up with a way, whether it's run blitzes with the linebackers, whether it's more stunting up front, whatever the case may be. I expect a scheme change or a tweak, not a change, a tweak that will stop the running game for the opponents or at least slow it down. Again, running the football and stopping the run in bad weather as we get to December and the weather's only going to get worse and in the playoffs when it's imperative to control the clock to control the other team's offense and make them one-dimensional, 
all of these things go into winning football at the most important time of the year. So I'm in, I'm very interested to see how that will work. Well, the Bills play the Chargers this Sunday. They go against Anthony Lynn, the former Bills head coach. He was an interim head coach when Rex decided to take his money and leave. And Anthony Lynn is a guy who I think is a very good football man. Unfortunately, the Chargers have found terrible ways to lose games this year. He won't be back next year. So I got to think that the team who really likes Anthony Lynn will be ready to play Sunday in Buffalo. Justin Herbert, the rookie quarterback, and in my opinion, the rookie of the year in the NFL offensively, is coming in off his first win as a starter last week. And Herbert's a lot like Josh Allen. Big, strong, athletic, throws the ball through a wall, has some accuracy issues at times. This is going to be a fun game to me to watch, for me to watch, because I think both teams are going to have the ability to get themselves to a point where they're going to score a lot of points. And I think the defense is whichever one makes a play is going to end up winning the game. The, the Chargers present a unique problem to the Bills' offensive line, too, because you're talking about Joey Bosa, and Bosa may be as good a pass rusher as there is in the league. So it, this is not a, a two-win team coming in, and the Bills are going to roll over them. I don't expect that at all. I expect a dogfight. Hopefully, Sean McDermott in a bye week has learned from his boss, former boss, Andy Reid, Nobody's better coming out of the bye week than Andy Reid. McDermott, being part of that staff, saw how Andy Reid handled the bye week. Hopefully, that will translate as well for the Bills going forward. The Bills finish up the season going to San Francisco. They play the Steelers at home. Should be a great one there. Then they travel to Denver, to New England, and they play the Dolphins. And they got a little bit of help with the Dolphins losing this past week out at Denver. Now, the Dolphins, a lot of people thought were a smoke and mirrors team. I think they're a very good defensive team. I think they're a little bit a ways away offensively. But this is now the Bills' division to win. They have a two-game lead with the tiebreaker over the Dolphins. So this is something that the Bills have to do this year win the AFC East. They'll be the first time in 25 years they have done so. This is a stretch run. Again, it is not participation trophies time anymore. Bills have been to the playoffs two of the last three years. Getting to the playoffs isn't enough. Winning the division isn't enough. It's one step closer, but it's not enough. So let's see where they go from here. It's going to be a fun way to close out the rest of the season. And if the Bills were to have any goal, in my opinion, the second half of the year, it's what I said, run the ball better, stop the run better. Do those two things. I think you win the division, go into a situation in the playoffs where you can be a team to get things done. Well, the Bills didn't play this week, but the other, a lot of other NFL teams did. Important games surrounding the Bills. Well, let's start with what happened in Denver. The Broncos get a 20 to 13 win over the, the Dolphins. And, and when you look at that game, the benching of Tua Tagovailoa gets the big headline. Brian Flores pulled his rookie quarterback out, went with Brian Fitzpatrick. Fitz got them in position to win the game. And like Fitz does so often, just when you think he's going to be the hero, he throws a pick and the game ends up going the other way. What does Miami do going forward? And to me, it's a simple question. You look at this, you're not going to change from Tua. Tua had a bad game. There's starting to be tape out there again on him. You know, when NFL defensive coordinators evaluate tape, they find a weakness. They try to limit your strengths, and you've got to adjust to that. And the good players make those adjustments. Tua is a good young player. He's now got to adjust to what the adjustment has been against him. Can he do it? We'll, we'll see. And I think still this is a tryout going forward because the Dolphins have a lot of draft capital that they've acquired and could possibly be a team to trade up should they see Justin Fields. Or I think 
I don't think they'll be in the mix for Trevor Lawrence, but Justin Fields will be available to them through trade possibly. They think that's a much better scenario, which I certainly don't agree with. They could possibly go that route. So I, I like what Flores said after the game. It's trying to win a game. And, and more teams should do this with young quarterbacks. If your young quarterback struggles and you've got a capable veteran, then go to that capable veteran in the second half of the game, win the game, get back to work the next week and, and get things back on track. I don't think it hurts the young kid whatsoever. So the Bills get a little bit of cushion. The Dolphins, I think, had maybe a little bit of sobriety about how their season is going and where it goes from here. So we'll see if they're able to come back from that. Monday Night Football, the Rams and Buccaneers, and you know, I talked about this a couple weeks ago. Tom Brady's just not Tom Brady anymore. I mean, he's still got the same name and he's got the same look. I mean, he dyes his hair. But beyond that, he's just another quarterback at this point. He's the greatest quarterback of all time, but at 43 years old, he's simply not the same guy. Last night, the difference in the game was Jared Goff is a lot better quarterback than Tom Brady is right now. Goff threw for 376 yards. He did turn it over a couple times. Brady turned it over a couple times as well. But Brady threw so many bad balls. It's just strange to see. And, and, you know, I remember as a kid, as a very young kid, watching Willie Mays as a member of the Mets. He wasn't Willie Mays anymore. He was just some guy wearing number 24. O.J. Simpson finished up as a 49er. Tony Dorsett went to Denver for a minute. Emmett Smith was in Arizona with the Cardinals. You see a lot of great players who finished their career elsewhere. Rarely do you have a Peyton Manning moment where finishing your career elsewhere leads to a championship. And frankly, Manning had one great year in Denver, and then the other year he won the Super Bowl based on a great defense. So even that, it's maybe the best of the all-time greats going elsewhere. It's just not the same. And I, I don't believe that Brady and the Bucks are going to go very far this year. I just don't think he's capable. Now, there are times he could go out and play very well, and I'm sure there's games here and there he's going to play well. But I do believe that Tom Brady – has slipped significantly from where he was. And frankly, that's to be expected when you're the greatest quarterback of all time. Fun game between the Ravens and the Titans. These two teams do not like each other. Two coaches do not like each other. They met in the playoffs last year, got after it a little bit. The Ravens are a team that's now wounded. And again, go back to what I said about defensive coordinators figuring guys out. They had an entire offseason to study Lamar Jackson. They have done so. Lamar Jackson has struggled this year to be the same guy he was last year. And I think Greg Roman and John Harbaugh are a little bit to blame as well. I think they're trying to get him to do something he's not comfortable with yet. And that's throw the ball more down the field to the wide receivers. Lamar Jackson was hugely successful last year because of the read option and the ability to throw to tight ends. Well, they lose a tight end. To injury, they lose a tight end to Atlanta in the offseason. So the tight end group isn't quite the same, but I think the offensive pro- approach isn't quite the same either. I also think that the three headed monster at running back isn't really doing Lamar a whole lot of favors. J.K. D- JK Dobbins is the primary runner, and then Mark Ingram, and of course, you still got Gus Edwards. Well, it's interesting this week, both Dobbins and Ingram are going to miss the Steeler game on Thanksgiving night because of COVID problems. That means Gus Edwards is probably the most popular name to pick up in fantasy football this week. So keep an eye on that. And I think really think Thursday night might be a must win game for the time for the Ravens, because as the Browns under the radar continue to win and they beat a bad Philadelphia team last week, I shouldn't say bad because They're an NFC East team, and bad is redundant. When you talk about an NFC East team, it's just a redundant statement to say they're bad. But watching Carson Wentz make bad decisions, throw terrible passes, I I don't understand it. When Carson Wentz came into the league as somebody who roots for the Dallas Cowboys, I didn't like him at all because I thought, man, this kid's really good, and Philadelphia is going to be set at quarterback for a long time. 
but something has happened along the way. I'm not sure what it is, but it's not right. And, you know, while many people focus the Browns on Baker Mayfield, it's the wrong place to look because this Browns team is all about the running game and the defense. And again, Nick Chubb being back, he had a big game, good win for the Browns. You look at that division, the NFC, the AFC North, Steelers are undefeated, the Browns eight and three. Now you've got a situation with the Ravens in third place. Are they able to still be a playoff team? So big, big game Thursday night. You know, I mentioned the AFC North and the Cincinnati Bengals are the other team. And unfortunately, the Bengals, it just seems to happen to bad teams and bad organizations. Joey Burrow is a guy I think we all agree is going to be a franchise quarterback. Took a lot of hits behind a bad offensive line this year. Got hit on Sunday tore his MCL, PCL, ACL, just ripped up his knee. Terrible, terrible situation. Possibility he misses the entire 2021 season as well. Obviously, there's no certainty to that, but this is a tough, tough break for a a bad franchise that finally had their guy. The one thing I will defend the Bengals on, a lot of people said, you know, do you think it was right to play him behind this offensive line? Look, football is a contact sport, and there are going to be times where guys get hurt, and it's part of the deal. If you draft a young quarterback, number one overall, that quarterback shows the ability to handle the situation, make the play calls play within the confines of the offense, make plays to help your team do better, then you made the right decision playing You can't not play a guy because you think he might get hurt. You can't do that. And I think it's asinine for for reporters to ask those questions. I'm not sure Zach Taylor, the Bengals head coach, is a guy who should be a head coach in the NFL. I'm not sure he's somebody fit for that position. But he's not going to get fired because he played Joe Burrow behind a bad offensive line. He's going to get fired because he didn't win games. And there's a good chance that happens this year. The Bengals, they've only got, I think, one win at this point. They're going to be a team that's drafting very high. They're not a team that's likely to draft a quarterback. Somebody who wants to come up and get a quarterback could do business with the Bengals. And the Bengals could benefit greatly from multiple high draft picks and really build a team around Joe Burrow when He does come back. Saints, speaking of her quarterbacks, Saints played the first week without Drew Brees, who has 11 rib fractures, 11. It's just amazing the the amount of abuse NFL players' bodies take. Well, Brees will likely be back for the playoffs, but will he be the same guy? We don't know. Taysom Hill got the start over Jameis Winston. I think a lot of people... We're surprised by that decision, but you're paying Jameis Winston $1 million. You're paying Taysom Hill $20 million. Maybe we shouldn't be all that surprised about it. Taysom Hill played relatively well. I heard somebody say he's a more athletic version of Tim Tebow, and I don't think that's fair because I think he's a much better passer than Tim Tebow. You look at the game, he was 18-23, to Two hundred thirty-three yards. Uses legs for two touchdowns. Ran for fifty-one yards. I think Taysom Hill is a very good example of a modern NFL quarterback. Again, in a short time period, there's not going to be a lot of time for guys to study film on the new way the Saints are going to play offense with Taysom Hill at quarterback. I think the opportunity is there for him to have success. And if he doesn't, Jameis is still on the sideline ready to go. So the Saints are in a good position. I don't think they win games with in the playoffs. I don't think they go deep without Drew Brees. But I do think their defense, which is the real reason this team is having the success it is, is good enough to get them to the playoffs and get them in a situation where Brees can come back. I think that they can be a dangerous team going forward the Texans beat the Patriots and you know this is weird to me this week 
because the Patriots come off a win where they ran the heck out of the football. And now this week they have Cam Newton throwing the ball 40 times. He threw for 365 yards. But by going away from what you did the week before, you give the Texans a chance to play a lot of offense as well. And Deshaun Watson, who's very capable, throws for 344 yards. It's it's a strange situation on a week-to-week league how teams just go one side. One week, they only run the ball. One week, they only throw the ball. How about developing an a game plan where you can mix both in, keep your opponent more off balance and figure things out. Tough loss for the Patriots. And I think that one is the one that did their season in. And again, go back to the bills for a minute. The AFC East is between the bills and Miami. The bills are now firmly in control of that division. There's six games left. That's a lot of time, but if they handle their business, they will get this AFC East title for the first time in a long time. The Colts are a very good football team. I like the Packers as the best team in the NFC. The Colts went toe-to-toe with the Packers, and when Phillip Rivers isn't asked to do too much, their defense and their offensive line and running game will win games. Phillip Rivers will turn the ball over, and he did Sunday, every time he goes out there. It's just the way he plays football at this point of his career. But when you can run the ball like the Colts did. Jonathan Taylor, the rookie out of Wisconsin, 22 carries, 90 yards. It, it's great to see the Colts morphing into a defense first team and complementing that with the running game. Frank Reich starting to figure it out in Indy. Watch the Colts in the playoffs as well. The Raiders in Kansas City game on Sunday night was a great football game. And Yes, the Raiders gave Patrick Mahomes too much time, and when you do that, he's going to beat you. Mahomes has gotten to the point where we don't even look at his stats anymore and think, well, he had a great game. He threw for 340 yards and two touchdowns. Yeah, it was all right. He hits Travis Kelsey late in the fourth quarter to secure the win. But what I think, again, look at the Colt or look at the Chiefs. They ran the ball for three touchdowns. Le'Veon Bell had his first touchdown of the year. You also had Clyde edwards Alaire had two touchdowns. The Chiefs can beat you so many ways. Unfortunately, their defense seems to have taken a step back. Derek Carr was great in this game. And the Raiders team, this Raiders team, we said it a few times on this podcast. I don't know that they're there yet, but they're certainly getting there. That's a team... I think that wins a playoff game this year. The way they run it with Josh Jacobs, the way Derek Carr has been playing, the defense isn't great, but some of the free agent acquisitions they've brought in, Nick Kwiatkowski, Jed Keith, these guys are helping that team get better. And I think that as the young kids grow with these veterans that you brought in, all of a sudden that Raiders team is starting to look a little different. John Gruden, And Mike Mayock got something going out in the desert. The last game I want to hit on this week, and it's not really worth talking a lot about the game, but the pregame story is the reason I'm talking about the game. The Vikings and Cowboys played, and it was actually an entertaining game on Sunday. The Cowboys ended up coming back. Andy Dalton throws a late touchdown pass, and they get the win. Ezekiel Elliott had over 100 yards for the first time this year. The Cowboys improved to three and seven and are only a half game out of first place in the awful NFC East. The Vikings, again, not able to get things done. But I want you to listen to Tom Pelissero of the NFL Network talk about what Mike McCarthy, the embattled head coach of the Cowboys, did the night before the game that may have brought this Cowboys team together. Well, Red, if the Cowboys go on a run here, we might look back on this win over the Vikings as the sledgehammer game. Saturday night at the team hotel in a meeting in a ballroom, Mike McCarthy gets up at the front of the room and says, guys, I want to apologize. I don't think I did a good enough job emphasizing our objectives for the week, one of which was to hammer the ball out of Dalvin Cook's hands. At that point, McCarthy pulls out a sledgehammer, not a prop, 
a full sledgehammer that you can knock a wall down with, and someone rolls in a bunch of watermelons. Each one has a different objective written on it. McCarthy reads the objective. Bam! Smashes the watermelon. He goes down the row doing this. The players are roaring. McCarthy's pants are soaked. Finally gets to the watermelon with Dalvin Cook's picture on it. Demarcus Lawrence jumps up and goes, I got to get that one. He hands over the sledgehammer to Lawrence. He smashes that watermelon. Look what it translates to in the game yesterday. They played inspired. They played physical. Donovan Wilson, the safety, comes up with two of the biggest plays in that game. A strip sack on Kirk Cousins where he probably got away with helmet-to-helmet contact. And then that monster hit on Dalvin Cook that jarred the the ball loose. And it was recovered by none other than Demarcus Lawrence. Just like that, Cowboys back in the NFC East race, and maybe, Rhett, finding their personality here. It's funny how sometimes quirky things bring teams together. And, you know, we'll see on Thursday the Cowboys play the Washington football team on Thanksgiving. You know, that's one of those old, old rivalries, and it's been part of many Thanksgivings. Thanksgiving Day games going back through the through my entire life essentially, and to watch what this team does Thursday will be the true indicator of if Mike McCarthy has finally gotten his guys. But it was definitely a different team on Sunday. They got rid of some dead weight. They got rid of Daryl Worley, the cornerback who was just awful and didn't buy in. The Bills picked him up, and every time I see him on the field for the Bills, I think bad things are going to happen, and they usually do. Don Terry Poe was just wasting space. They cleaned out some veterans who obviously weren't buying in. Now they're trying to get guys to buy in. Is it too late? Well, no. In the NFC East, it certainly isn't. They play Washington. They're at Baltimore and Cincinnati. They then have San Francisco, Philadelphia at home before finishing up against the Giants. So I I still think they have a chance to win the division, and I don't know if that's worth even discussing. But – Remember, if the Cowboys do play a little better this second half, even without Dak Prescott, and they come down to watermelons and a Gallagher impression by head coach Mike McCarthy that brought the team together. And that kind of morphs me into the next topic I want to talk about. When Sean McDermott was hired by the Bills, it was all about culture and process and wanting to get things done. And, you know, a lot of people, and I was one of them, think, all right, whatever, dude. You know, how, how important is culture? How important is all of this team building stuff? And the more time I spend analyzing football, analyzing the way teams that are successful do it versus the teams that aren't, I think it's incredibly important. Just showing the example of what the Cowboys did differently this week with their team and the result it had not because they beat the Vikings, how they played against the Vikings. And that's where I think it's interesting. A couple of weeks ago, urban Meyer, who I think is one of the great college coaches of all time, had a segment on his pregame show on Fox TV that I just thought was fantastic. Listen to urban Meyer talk about, responsibility and what he thinks is important to team building. There's one term that you forgot. It, it's an elite term as well. <laughs> fast, right? fast. You're welcome. You're welcome. No, I love fast, fast. <laughs> check under the hood. So what is check under the hood? When, when you tell somebody to go check under the hood, what are you telling them to go do? Well, so many of us are excuse makers. I mean, that's the way that's part of who we are. And it, and it shouldn't be that way. When you see a team struggle, the first thing the fans and the, and the media blame are the players or they blame the coaches. It's never more evident than the NFL. I always laugh every week when I'll hear someone say, well, they got bad players in the NFL, some team that always struggles. I'm thinking, wait a minute. Think about what you just said. There's not a bad player in the NFL. They're NFL players. Same with the coach. You can't say, well, he's a bad coach. Now, maybe they're not coaching well or maybe the player's not playing well, but that's where I always say, lift under the hood. Never make excuses. When, when I was a coach, I would never let one of my coaches say he's a bad player. I'd warn him and say, say that again, you probably have to leave because that's just, you're making excuses. Now, yeah. dig deep and find out why. Every time I've had a team struggle, every time, it's fallen one of three categories. Number one, there's some trust issue. The players don't trust the coach. The coach don't trust the players or 
awful when the players don't trust each other. Number two, you really think about it, it's called a dysfunctional work environment, Reggie, and that's that, where the expectations are very high, but we don't work hard. I've been there before, Coach. It's, and, and the coach has to be real clear with his team, say, wait a minute, that's going to lead to frustration, anger, disappointment, because we want to win a championship. I got news, guys, we're not working hard. So quit, stop with the yeah. expectations. If you're, your work ethic must exceed or equate your expectations, that's a good environment. And the last one is real obvious. you got a selfish team, man. you got problems on your team. Football is an unselfish sport. That means mm-hmm. you got to do the nasty that means I'm a running back. I got to go protect for my quarterback. Yeah. That you don't always get to carry the ball. Sometimes you have to run down a kickoff 22 miles an hour and throw yourself into someone coming 15 miles an hour the other way. That's not fun. Why would you do that? Because you love your team and your teammates. So when you hear mm. LSU, Penn State, Wolverine struggling, stop with the bad players. I, I get sick of hearing that. It's not the players. Mm. I don't think it's the coaches. But there's something wrong. Lift the hood. Find out one of those three things is usually the reason. Every high school coach should listen to that speech. Every high school coach should break down those three things. Trust, dysfunctional work environment, selfishness, and preach those things to create a culture. And it's funny as I watch that, when it came to dysfunctional work environment, and when Urban Meyer was talking about that, we looked at Reggie Bush and said something to Reggie. Reggie said, I've been there, coach. And all I could think of, was when Reggie Bush was a member of the Buffalo Bills and Rex Ryan was the head coach. Was that what Reggie Bush was talking about? Wouldn't surprise me at all because that was as dysfunctional as dysfunctional can get. So an interesting approach by Urban Meyer, and I think one that too many guys forget about. And and I think the guys who are successful in building programs – whether it be at the high school level, the college level, or the NFL level. Program building is about doing the same thing the right way all the time and getting people to buy in. And how do you do that? And, and, and I think Urban Meyer nailed it. You've got to develop a trust between the players and the coaches. And you know How many of us fully trust our bosses at our job? If you have a good boss at your job, you trust them. And that breeds a better work environment. How many times do we work in a dysfunctional work environment? We know we're not doing the best job we can because you can't succeed in that environment. And and, and anytime you're selfish in your work environment, you're going to hurt the overall product of the work environment. So I think it's not only good for coaching. I think it's great to look at as well when you're – a business person or a manager or whatever, those three things. And that that's gold from Urban Meyer. I also grabbed a clip and, and this is to me, the, the mind of a great coach from Jimmy Johnson talking about Bill's fans. I'm sorry. Talking about the first Cowboys Bills Super Bowl back in the nineties and his approach to it. And I want you to listen to Jimmy Johnson talk about that because to think about, Being the most confident, and you'll hear Jimmy say this, most confident he ever was going into a game was that game for these reasons. Listen to Jimmy Johnson talk about the Super Bowl many years ago. Hey, Jimmy, the Cowboys were a a six-and-a-half-point underdog heading into that first Super Bowl against the Bills. Just how confident were you entering that game? Rick, I, I don't think in my entire coaching career um, I was more confident than that one particular game. Uh, we had done something. Everybody had a real problem with Buffalo in their, you know, hurry up, no huddle offense. And they would just get the opponent so tired and they and the opponent wouldn't be ready for the play. And so they would go up and down the field. Uh, But the only thing is they turned the ball over. Uh, But they were so explosive on offense that they could overcome those turnovers. Well, what we did, we took every player on our roster and we ran two offensive huddles against our defense. 
And that what that, you know, with only a 53 man roster, that means that your first teamers are going to have to run some offense. Uh, so here you've got Troy Aikman and Emmett Smith running scout team <laughs> against our defense. But but I was running plays against our defense, just one right after another, so that our defense could get accustomed to that hurry up style and a no huddle style. And that's the way we practiced. And so I knew you know, that our defense was going to be ready. And that was the key against Buffalo. And the other thing, I knew that we protected the football. Uh, you know, I was always a stickler on holding on the football. That's why I cut Kirby Richards in that Chicago game because he fumbled a couple of times. And we didn't turn the ball over through the playoffs up until the Super Bowl when Leon had his uh, <laughs> little fumble uh, that, uh, there at the end zone, but the game was put away by that time. I love the mind of great coaches, and I think it's fascinating to listen to. And if you look around the NFL right now, what Andy Reid has built, and yes, we say Patrick Mahomes, but this was being built with Alex Smith before Patrick Mahomes. That that culture, that situation was something that was being built there. Look what John Gruden is doing with the Raiders in Oakland. Sean McDermott certainly has built it. And, and it's finding what you do well, finding a way to get players to buy in. And I think that's the biggest thing is getting players to buy in. And when you do that, and obviously nobody's ever done it the way Bill Belichick has. When you do that and you find the success, I, I really think it's amazing that coaches are able to do it year after year after year. And, you know, the Patriots – having a down year this year, but there's no doubt in my mind they will bounce back from this. They had more opt-outs than any other team in the league. They bring in Cam Newton at the very end. They, they've had injuries. This is a team still, as long as Bill Belichick is there, that I believe will be a force in the NFL to come, and it's because of the culture and the method methodology that they have. So just wanted to talk about that for a little while because I, I find it fascinating. The NBA draft was the other night, and, and it was great to see Rochester's own Isaiah Stewart go number 15. Portland drafted him, traded him to Detroit. Detroit now headed up by Troy Weaver, if that name sounds familiar to you. He was an assistant back in the early 2000s for Jim Beheim. He was the one that Beheim credits for bringing Carmelo Anthony into SU. Troy Weaver also reported, according to Beheim, had he had Troy Weaver stayed at Syracuse, then Kevin Durant would have ended up at SU as well. So you look at Troy Weaver, there's certainly a Syracuse connection. Mike Hopkins, the Washington coach, they know of each other well. So it was great to see Isaiah get that opportunity. And, you know, you're watching the NBA draft and, to see the young man, a kid from here, went to McQuaid for a couple of years, get drafted 15th overall, the highest ever for anybody out of the Flower City. It's great to see it's with, he's with guys who had great influence on him, including Scott Fitch, the Fairport basketball coach. Just a great night for Rochester basketball. And it continued. Quentin Rose, who signed a contract with the Sacramento Kings. We'll go to camp with them, may end up in the G League, but he's going to have an opportunity. And just recently, Anthony Lamb also gets an opportunity to go to camp with the Detroit Pistons. Again, may end up in the G League, but you know this is three kids who played their basketball here in the 5A5 going to NBA camps. One of them's a high draft pick and will definitely make the team. The other two may end up in the in the G League. We've obviously already got Thomas Bryant playing with the Wizards. I, I just think this is fantastic for our area that we have three more kids trying to break into the NBA. I don't I, – we could argue who's the greatest team in the area of all time, who's the greatest player in the area of all time. I don't ever remember a time where the highest level of basketball has been as good as it is right now. When we're talking about our Section 5 athletes going to the NBA or getting an opportunity or getting drafted in the first round, 
this is something that hasn't happened. Not very often. And it's great to see. And I couldn't be prouder of all of these young men. Congratulations to them and to their families on a mission well accomplished and all the best going forward. Oh, while we were talking about basketball, college basketball, uh, 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 it starts this week, somehow, some way. In the midst of this pandemic and the COVID spiking and teams and cam- uh, campuses being put on pause, somehow college basketball is moving forward. And Syracuse, they're on pause, but apparently they're opening their schedule on Friday at the Dome against Bryant. Now it's going to look a lot different. No people in the Dome, just players. But this is a team this year for SU that I think is going to be a little bit fun to watch. And I might have been the only one, but I enjoyed watching last year's team because I thought they got as much as they could have out of what they were. They lose out Elijah Hughes, who got drafted, and, and, and it, that's a big loss because Elijah was the one guy who could score on his own. Off the bounce, he could shoot from deep. He could get his own. But this year's team returns Buddy Beheim, who is now a junior. Buddy, last year, 15.3 points a game, 37% from three, improved greatly. What Buddy Beheim did last year, I never thought he would do at Syracuse. I think the expectation this year for Buddy is more of the same. I don't expect a big step forward, but I think more of the same. Maybe the shooting percentages and the efficiencies go up a little bit, but there's a ceiling there. Joe Girard play, played a lot last year as a freshman. You know, everyone said, wow, he's coming out of Glens Falls. How can he even play there? Well, he averaged 12.4 points, the, led the team in steals, assists. He was a very good freshman point guard considering everything that went on around him. Where he struggled last year, it was surprising to me, was his three-point shot. Shot only 32% from three. I think that number goes up this year as the shots get better. And I think there's going to be games, we saw it last year a couple times, where he's going to have the ability to get hot and take over. And I think that Gerard will, this year, instead of 12, he may go to 15 like Buddy did. Take that step forward. But again, the efficiency going forward. The big improvement or will at least maintain this year will come if Alan Griffin, the transfer from Illinois, is as expected. Alan Griffin last year in the Big Ten shot 42% from three-point range. This is a kid who's got decent size for a small forward. He's 6'5", 6'6", very athletic, can shoot it from deep. So now you think about what I just talked about. Bayheim, Bayheim, Gerard, and Griffin all three can shoot it from deep, it's going to force guys out. So that means the guys in the middle are going to have opportunities. Marek Dolezal, amazingly, is a senior. Marek has improved every year and gotten better and better. And when he can do things offensively, this team is better. He's a smart basketball player, high basketball IQ I think he will have a very nice senior year. And the other senior who starts is Barama Sidibe. And, you know, well, a lot of us look at Barama and think, ah, this guy can't play. I want to point out that the last six games of the year last year, Barama Sidibe was in double figures and rebounding. He really grew at the end of the season. If that carries over, I like this starting five. That brings Quincy Guerrier, a freshman last year we didn't know at the time, was playing with a groin injury that needed surgery. He's going to be back coming off the bench. This is a kid with an NBA body. If his shot improves, I think his offensive game will be very good. They're bringing in a freshman, Kadari Richmond from New York. This is a combo guard. He'll be the third guard off the bench, and I think he's another kid who can shoot it. So – You've got depth at the forward positions. You've got depth at the guard. And for the first time, maybe in a long time, I think there's some depth at the center position as well. Jesse Edwards, who's very skinny but skilled offensively, he saw some time last year and at moments flashed some things that you look at and you go, wow, for a big kid to be able to do that, there's a lot there. And John Ball is Jacques is a 6'10 kid who's a little thicker than Jesse Edwards, but may have better range on his shot. Kid who can shoot it a little bit. And in the Jim Bayheim era, have they ever had a stretch four or five? I don't believe they have. I'm not saying John Balazac is at this point, 
but he may work into one. So there is depth. This team, again, going in the ACC, it's such a strange year. We don't know what to expect. But I think the fact you're returning four starters, a fifth if you want to count Quincy Garrier, you're bringing in a transfer who's started before. You're not relying on a lot of young freshmen. I think this team has a chance to be okay. I don't think they'll be great, but I think if there is a tournament this year, this is a team that could get in the tournament. I, for one, just excited that we're going to have hoops to watch. So that's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great Thanksgiving. We'll talk next week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and again, happy Thanksgiving to y'all. I'm Carl Falk. This is the Falcon Around Podcast.